Now you're looking at the rarest of the rare Amiga add-ons and the last project that Commodore ever worked on and possibly the only surviving example in the entire world. Today, we're going to get the story of the Amiga CD1200. And if you enjoy my videos on YouTube, I'm sure you will love my weekly retro gaming podcast. New episodes released every Friday from theretrohour.com. The springtime of 1994 is not really a time that most Amiga fans remember very fondly. As around then, the magazine headlines were filled with monthly stories about Commodore's huge financial losses, followed very shortly after by the computer giant's bankruptcy when Commodore International went bust on April 29th of 1994. The brand that brought us classic machines like the Commodore 64, the Amiga 500 and the VIC-20 was now no more and really this did mark the end of the Amiga's life as a commercial mainstream platform. But even in those final dark months of Commodore, there were some interesting and now extremely rare products that were being worked on. In the April 94 issues of most Amiga magazines, they covered two really interesting bits of late Commodore hardware. First of all, the Commodore Amiga 4000 Tower, the daddy of the Amiga range, an 040 based Amiga 4000 in a giant, but I've got to say, very stylish looking computer case. Now the production of the A4000T was resumed by Commodore's successor SCOM a year later in 1995, but the Commodore version has got its own custom case which looks totally different to the more common SCOM variant. And the Commodore version of the Amiga 4000 Tower is actually extremely rare. In fact, it's estimated only 200 Commodore Amiga 4000 Ts actually rolled off the production line with only a handful of them remaining today. But even more rare was a device which allowed Amiga 1200 users to play games written for Commodore's CD32 console, which was launched in the previous September. Now, the CD32 was only on sale for a mere six months before the company went under, but actually managed to get quite a big following and some success in the UK, where briefly, the CD32 actually became the predominant CD platform, with its games outselling Sega Mega CD and PC CD-ROM titles over Christmas of 1993. The CD-ROM revolution was finally taking off after a false start with the CDTV and the CDI, and Amiga 1200 users wanted a piece of the action. Commodore did release a CD-ROM drive for their older Amiga 500 machine in 1992, but the Amiga A570 drive only worked with titles released for their previous CDTV platform, and it used the Amiga 500's custom edge connector, meaning there was no way to connect the A570 to any other Amiga model. The answer to this problem graced the cover of most Amiga mags in April 1994, and it was called the CD-1200. This funky looking CD-ROM drive connected to the Amiga 1200 and would allow it to seamlessly play all the games and titles released for Commodore CD32 console. And looking at it, it actually looks just like a CD32, chopped in half and painted white. Featuring a top loading mechanism, this definitely is a unique looking CD-ROM drive. Sadly, the bankruptcy of Commodore International was announced just days after this drive was demoed at the 1994 CBIT show in Germany, and the CD1200 never made it into production. But what happened to that prototype that was demoed in all of the Amiga magazines? This has been a question that has been asked on the Amiga forums, on Facebook, and on Usenet for more than 20 years. Now, a little glimmer of light did appear in early 2001 when a new company came onto the Amiga scene called Melancia Industries. They took out full-page glossy ads on the back cover of the final remaining Amiga High Street magazine, Amiga Active, and they also had a website claiming to be the next big thing. They even hired former Amiga developer Dave Haney to work on new PAL PC systems. Sadly, as time went on, it turned out that Melancia Industries was a total sham. And according to a statement released on Usenet by Dave Haney, the owner of the company, who went by the name of Dr. Ryan Kowinski, was actually an 18-year-old kid pretending to be a 40-year-old businessman and company owner. And his secretary actually turned out to be his mother. After not paying Dave over $55,000 worth of salary, Melancia Industries vanished, as did Dr. Ryan. But interestingly... Dr. Ryan did appear to own a dark grey charcoal colour version of the CD1200. 
or the case at least. Now, he showed this to a few Amiga websites and shared a few pictures, and there was even talk on some forums and Usenet that Ryan had embedded this CD1200 prototype in the bonnet of his DeLorean car. To be honest, nothing really shocks me when we're talking about the world of Amiga. But what about that white, more finished prototype, the one that appeared in all the magazines and was apparently working back in April of 1994? Most people assumed this ended up in a skip at the back of Commodore after the bankruptcy, or maybe their eventual buyer Escom and Amiga Technologies had it somewhere and then it got lost over the years. But then, in November of 2016, that question was finally answered. Ravi Abbott, who I host my Retro Hour podcast with, took a trip to the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester one Saturday morning late last year, and he sent me some really interesting pictures. Now, I was actually working at the time and almost fell out of my seat. There it was, the white Amiga CD1200 prototype in Leicester, of all places, just up the road from where I am. Now, the owners of the museum knew that this drive must have been something pretty special as they had no idea what it was initially and the drive was actually sitting in storage at the back of the museum. After Ravi got a bit of a tour around there, he made a short video on this and we made a couple of forum posts talking about this discovery. Interest started to rise and the museum actually did some more research on the story of the CD1200 and then moved that prototype into its rightful place in a display cabinet in the main museum. Last month, we actually hosted an event with Commodore UK's former managing director, David Pleasance, at the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester. So I thought this would be the perfect time for me to finally get a look at the CD1200 prototype and also find out some more on the story from David himself, who was the managing director of Commodore UK at the time and would have been responsible for releasing and marketing this product in the UK had it ever been released. Now, I've got to say a massive thank you to Andy from the Retro Computer Museum, who allowed me to very carefully take this out of the display cabinet and get a closer look at it. Now, as you can see, the CD1200 does look very much like a white CD32 drive. And in fact, this prototype has seen better days and the CD lid appears to be jammed in place. But looking around the drive, we have the CD1200 logo in the same style as the later Amiga case badges. And there are some CD and power activity lights in the corner. Now on the side of the CD1200, we've got a headphone jack and a volume control for it. On the back, we've got some standard phono and RCA ports for audio mixing, a port for data transfer that would have connected to the Amiga 1200's trapdoor port, a power switch and a PSU connector. Now let's hear from David Pleasance and the man who found this drive, Andy Spencer from the Retro Computer Museum to find out a little bit more about it. Now I will just say there is a bit of background noise for the first minute or so as there was a DJ performing in the next room but the music does stop after the first 60 seconds. Well here we have a CD1200. It's the prototype of a CD drive that would plug into the Amiga 1200 and basically turn into a CD32. Would have been wonderful to have one. And David, that was going to be launched in 1994. What do you remember about this drive? Well, what I remember is that for the very first time ever in my 12 plus years with Commodore, we were, we were launching a product where the whole thing was planned properly from the beginning to the very end. And by that I mean we had, um, because as you probably know, we had a fantastic relationship in the UK with all the major software publishers, uh, which we'd worked on for several years. And what we'd done is that we had signed them up to NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, about the CD32, and they all we gave them all uh, development kits, and they were all writing specific software which would utilise all the special features of the CD32. And lo and behold, uh, our um, uh, intrepid leader, Mr. Mehdi Ali, decided in his infinite wisdom, he wanted to be greedy and he wanted to bring the launch of the CD32 forward. Right now, the, this, this product here was part of our plan that when we launched the CD32, which was planned actually to be launched in the spring, early summer of the following year, when we launched the CD32, at which time we would have had lots and lots of software written specifically for it to take advantage of it, that we believed 
that many, many 1,200 owners would be jealous. Yes. Yeah. So the Absolutely. idea was to have this product that they could buy an add-on and allow them to use the new software. Brilliant. Yeah. But of course, what happened is he was greedy. He brought the he brought the launch forward in spite of being warned. Believe me, by me, very, very strongly, that it would kill the sales of the A1200, which were all booked in, all recorded, all the orders were in place for Christmas. I said it will kill the 1200. He said he wanted the additional sales that the CD32 would bring, in spite of the fact there was no software for it. And the bottom line is that everything I predicted came true. And then, then of course, to add insult to injury, because of a licensing situation in the Philippines, they they they. Um, they grabbed uh, and held, they would not let any of the um, CD32s released from the Philippines. So not only did we screw up our 1200 market, we didn't have any CD32s to sell into the market either. So this product was just left by the wayside. Well, Andy, how did, I mean, this is like what, revision two? Is that the yeah, second it's, model? It's, it's, yeah, number two, Rev Zero. How did that end up in Leicester, in the Retro Computer I, Museum? I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mal, the guy that actually owned the Commodore shop in, it was called the Cavendish, Cavendish Com Computer, Computer Centre. Center, yeah. but it was called the Cav Cavendish Commodore Centre. Thank it was. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which he, I argued with him, by the way, about that. When I first met him, I said, "You're crazy." He was a friend. Of, he's a friend of mine I as mean, well. We were yeah, friends, a friend, mutual friend. Friend. In fact, Malcolm and Ron, his his, uh, his lovely wife, yeah. they were the first people I ever met in the retail division of Commodore when I was brought into the retail division. We, we we were having a uh, uh, one of the Commodore shows that we used to hold, hold regularly in Novotel, and um, uh, apparently what had happened is that the Commodore had run a competition for independent dealers, and I think there was five or four or five independent dealers won this competition, and and the prize was dinner on Commodore, and I was told you got to host that dinner. <laughs> it was my very first ever role, and that's when I met uh, Malcolm and Rona on that particular day, and. Um, all I, all I do know is that um, the Markham was an absolute gentleman, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a brilliant businessman, yeah. very clever businessman, and um, he and I forged a great friendship. He stayed at my place, I've stayed at his. In fact, he used to own a place in Tenerife, yeah. and we've even gone over there and stayed at his place in Tenerife. That's the relationship that we had. Now, how he actually got hold of this, I have no idea. <laughs> I promise you it wasn't me, but he knew all the right people. Yeah, I, I get the feeling. I mean, it actually came from, I know it came from there um, and um, we we found it in a barn he literally found it in a barn and the barn was full of everything that came from the Cavendish Centre when right. it closed right. somebody was paid to clear it and right. they just all this stuff right. a lot of it and I know some 4000s were in there and some 4000 towers were in there they got scrapped they literally got chucked into a big skip wow. which, which I find devastating um, but the rest of the stuff went into um, a barn, a dusty barn. It was dry, but it was really, very dusty. Um, along with machine returns, all sorts of customer returns, all sorts sure. of things, all got put there. Loads of software packs, and everything. Um, and the guys contacted me that uh, they'd got this barn, and basically said, you know, um, would you be interested in, you know, giving us a, the price, uh, the price, price you interested and, in? Yeah. And I said, okay, we'll take the whole lot. Um, we we came to some sort of, you know, an arrangement that suited us both. Um, and, and inside the barn as well was also TP five hundred. Wow. Um, one was working at the time, one wasn't. The second one has now died as well. We're not really sure what's wrong with it at the moment, but hopefully we can look at it when we get five minutes and when we get a new workshop sorted. Um, this was in there, and there's loads of other bits of soft software and all sorts of strange bits and bobs mm. that we've kept, including the signs we've got out there now as well, because they're, they're quite rare, I guess. Um, to get hold of this, it, it was literally I saw it and went. That's that's like that's I've, never, I've never seen one of those. Yeah. That's quite rare. Uh, I know my Commodore stuff. I've, I mean, I've been a Commodore fan for a long time. You know, before, Vic Twenty days even. Um, and I saw this and went, I don't know what that is. That's quite scary because I know what every Commodore part is, and, and, and I wanted this straight away. So I, I made sure I got we got it, and the rest is sort mm. of history. Yeah, and so that's when you, you knew you had something special. Yes, 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 because because it, it's literally yeah. You know, when you when it looked like a CD32, but it wasn't. I thought, has it been hacked by somebody? You know, no, no, it's not. It's actually come from Commodore like that. that is, well, what do you know about this machine then? I mean, if you, can you give us a little tour of what's on it and how well, it works? From the side, it's obviously headphones and volume, which is pretty straightforward. On the other side, there's nothing. 
it's normal CD drive inside, which actually does look a but little bit like, higher. Yeah, does look a little yeah. bit like the CD32. Is the hinge broke it, on this it, model? It does open, but I don't want to pull it too far. And the back is the interesting piece because obviously it would come from the Amiga yeah. into the audio and then back out to your audio source, your audio, yeah, your audio yeah. output, amp, sorry. Amp, yeah. um, DC input, which looks a bit like a normal um, like a, a 15412 or something like yeah. that, or maybe maybe something like that. An off switch, obviously, and then this is the interesting bit. We believe a cable comes from this and goes into the trapdoor of the Amiga 1200. Um, we've heard three different stories about this. Um, one of which is the trapdoor part is the control and everything, and a bit like a, a SCSI interface of some sort or something like that, or an IDE interface or something like that. But I can't really see that personally. Um, and the with that one of the devices, the board itself was the Kiko chip and everything else that needed to run the. CD32 games, but the one I actually believe is this actually has got a, a Kiko chip in it. You might, I don't know if you know any more than me. No, I don't. Um, but you know, we can find out. We can find out? Yeah. How? We can ask Jeff Porter, and um, you know, I was with Jeff Porter a couple of weeks ago. Oh. He's writing a chapter from oh. the book. <laughs> Sam has got a few contacts. You've got, you've, you've, you've you know a few well, people. Right. Yes, yes. So, so I, the, I would love to find out what exactly what it is. And we will. We will, I don't mind opening and it. And Dave Haney, of course. I mean, I talk to Dave if, every if, week. If we can talk to, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, how you know? So essentially, what we're missing at the moment is that data cable the and trapdoor interface. Yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, the audio will be fine. No problems at all. The pa we need to know if we can find out the exact power. Yeah. If it is something like a normal Commodore. Output, it'd be bloody fantastic. So you've not tried to power it on yet? No, I've okay. not. I've there's, not no, there's no reason why it would be anything different. No, I, 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 and that's the way I feel about it. Mind um, you, with Commodore, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, um, uh, yes, I, we, we will have it open at some point. We're waiting for our... We're just currently building our new workshop at the moment. Once we've got a workshop built, I will be doing, um, along, along with probably Simon, um, and, and probably one or two of the other guys, probably um, Dean and, um, and Stu and you know anybody else that wants to be there, Jim, and... Um, we'll 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 do something, um, do a video, I think. Of but I think you 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 must understand the idea, the concept of this, to be sold pretty much immediately after we launched a CD32. If the launch had been done when it was supposed to have yeah. been done, after the Christmas we'd sold all the 1200s, mm -hmm. which were what we had all on order. Then we launched a CD32 early spring, late summer, and then we, after that you launch this. So that all the 1,200 people are not suddenly left all on their own. Yeah. Makes it, it was the first time, as I said, in all the years I was with Commodore that they'd actually planned something properly. Yeah. But can I just say as an aside, by the way, that um, you, you finding this from somebody who bought all of Malcolm's stock, when we sold everything that was left in Commodore UK's offices, and yeah. remember, we were the last uh, Commodore subsidiary to close, yeah because we were the strongest right yeah. from the start. Yeah. I rescued the, uh, the Royal Warrant oh, wow. from the skip. Oh, wow. And I hate to say, I'm sorry to say, I actually gave it to the Cambridge Museum. That's fine. But I, I needed they're, they're it to be... They're friends of mine, anyway. Well, I needed it to be somewhere. In fact, I had the Smithsonian Institute on to me. They wanted it. Yeah, I can imagine. But I didn't, I didn't want it to go to America, because it's a British thing. The Royal Warrant is very British. Yeah. So it, was, I, it, it did go... But it's there. At least it's there, and it's, it's where it should it's, be. It's brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. So the goal is next then, so eventually you're hoping people can come to the Retro Computer Museum and actually play CD32 games on that I eventually? Would love, I would love that to happen. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It, I, I, I feel it may not happen. However, with your contacts... You never know. You with never your know. contacts, we may be able to get something from it. If we, can t if we can power it on and it spins, I'd be happy. You know what you can do, though? What I would do, and look, because obviously, as a non-profit-making entity as you are, you could say to people, bring your own 1200s and have a play, and it's cost you... Couple of quid an hour. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah. just for the just for the fun of and, and uniqueness of it. Yeah, yeah. And that will help to raise funds. Absolutely. What do you think of that as an idea? Lovely Sounds idea. great to me. Uh, every Amiga fan would love to. The, that is the Holy Grail. Yeah. yeah. Even to hold it, I think. <laughs> it's heavier than you expect. It is, yeah. I mean, that's why we think there's more in more in here. It's not just a CD drive. No. There is definitely more in there than a CD drive. So I think the Kiko chips in there and everything. Mm, I, mean, I know what a Kiko chip looks like. So I think once we open it and I see that Kiko chip, I'll be very happy. Because it, it is to me a CD32 then, just a cut down version. I'll have to, I'll get in touch with Malcolm because I, I haven't spoken to him for ages, but uh, I am in touch with him. I got his email address. Cool. And I'll find out where he got it from and how he got it because it's a good story. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. isn't it? In fact, I might even put it in my book. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, why not?
<laughs> if I can get the true, you know, if I can get the background from it. I'd love to well, really, that was because I remember that was demoed at the Seabit show. It was. 1994. It was, absolutely, yeah. Uh, April, May, literally days before Commodore well, declared bankruptcy. We've got the Amiga format that he's showed in yeah. as well. It's, there's not much in there about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'd love to find out a bit more about it, where it came from, and you know, I mean, it, obviously, it would have been made in America, so it wouldn't have come from America. Yeah, I mean, it would have been designed and built there, and then oh, yeah. shipped over. So how in the West hell? Chester, well, how how in somebody in Leicester get it? Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I, you can't be certain it was built in America. It certainly would have been designed in America. Yeah. But they had they had sources all over the place that they were actually getting stuff built from. Um, and, uh, and maybe they were pulling a few favours from people. You yeah, maybe. Know. Yeah, maybe. You absolutely. Never know, yeah. Honestly, you know. in those dying days of the company, I guess things were probably pretty desperate for yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, whoever knows. could design it and get it. But I mean, I, I think, as I said, this was an ideal, a logical step. Mm. And I was blown away because Commodore having logical steps. Yeah, that <laughs> didn't make any sense. No. So, so that, that could have been on every Amiga 1200 on his desk. Yeah, it would have. It would have been, yeah. wouldn't it? So yeah. now you. They would have, I think Commodore would have literally sold as many 1200s. The, 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 the yeah. because I, I would have wanted one. CD-ROM was so hot then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and to be fair, even I mean, one of the games that springs to my mind with the intro on it is Superfrog. <laughs> Superfrog was stunning. Mm. And the intro, the CD32 version, is wonderful. So you know, to be able to play that on your yeah, stock, you could have, we could have brought this as the next big jump. Absolutely. Yeah, it would have been. <laughs> it would have been. <laughs> I never stopped. Though. I can't <laughs> help it. You know. <laughs> what could have been the way, guys? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, all very interesting so far, I think you'll agree. But when I was at the event, I did share a couple of pictures of the CD1200 onto the Commodore Amiga Facebook group to get a bit of reaction and maybe, you know, wind a few people up as well. Uh, kind of making out like it was mine. It obviously wasn't. It belonged to the museum. What I didn't expect to get, though, was a reply from Beth Richard. Now, Beth was working for Commodore at the time, and she was actually the original designer of the CD1200 prototype, and she offered some really interesting details about the drive, and she confirmed that the missing trapdoor card did contain the Akiko chip, which is needed to drive the CD-ROM drive's logic. And she confirmed they only ever made nine of these prototype drives, so this is extremely rare. Now, Beth is actually in contact with the guys from the Retro Computer Museum to give them some advice on getting this prototype working again, and they are actually in talks for Beth to come over to the UK and have a look at this remaining example of the CD1200 and maybe see if she can help get it up and running again. So I am confident with Beth's help, somebody can make a new trapdoor card and hopefully they can get this rarest of the rare Amiga prototype up and running again for everybody, all Amiga fans to go and enjoy. So I'll definitely be revisiting the CD1200 at some point in the future and hopefully doing a positive follow-up story to this when the drive is working. And if you've watched this video all the way to the end, I've got one final question for you. If somebody was, hypothetically speaking of course, to recreate some of these drives, maybe do a crowdfunder to make some actual working CD1200s, who would be interested in buying one and how much would you be prepared to pay? Leave a comment and let me know in the video comments because I've got somebody asking me. I can't say any more, but please do let me know. If there's enough interest, I'll do a follow-up video on this and maybe we can get that project up and running. So thank you for watching this video about the Amiga CD1200 and I'll catch you next time.